not to mention the Russians. And of course, the main nu nuclear armed countries that Iran is concerned about is not North Korea and the Russians and so forth, it's the US and Israel, and of course, uh, Barack didn't mention that. Let me say a few things about the sanctions. And I think, I mean, the main thing is, and if there's one thing we know about sanctions is that sanctions are an act of war. They're not, they're not you know, uh, a, a harmless little thing that will possibly you know, bring, quote, good behavior from the Iranian regime. Especially the recent, uh, recently imposed sanctions and I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Since the early years of the 1979 and the hostage crisis, Iran has been under U.S. sanctions. And this was actually a significant factor in the Iran-Iraq war because virtually all of Iran's military equipment and armaments were U.S. made and for repairs and ammunition and so forth, they needed the U.S. So the sanctions uh, created problems in the war for the Iranian regime. And uh, you know, it was in December 2006 that the UN Security Council first imposed sanctions on Iran for its nuclear program. But those sanctions between 2006 until you know, late 2011, they were not really crippling sanctions. They did harm Iran. They made it harder to uh, conduct some uh, you know, kinds of trade and so forth. Uh, but even through those sanctions up to recently, Iran had managed uh, you know, modest economic growth, you know, the IMF said 3% in the last year and so forth. But the recent U.S. sanctions, which were passed in December 2011 by U.S. Congress, is not just a statement of U.S. refusal to buy Iran's oil. That's not what it is. It gives the U.S. government the right to punish third-party governments and companies which buy oil from Iran. In other words, it's not saying the U.S. is not going to buy Iran's oil, which wasn't even happening anyway. It says to any government and any private entity, if you're going to buy Iranian crude oil, we're going to boycott you, we're going to sanction you, we're going to punish you. And if you want trade with the US, uh, you better not do it. And what that does, and of course, every country looks at the situation, and as much as they may want to purchase oil from Iran, whether they can get better terms for it or better prices and so forth, I mean, very few companies and countries uh, are able to, uh, you know, kind of part with any kind of business relationships uh, with the U.S. So it makes it extremely difficult for Iran to sell its oil. And as soon as this announcement came, I mean, the idea was that they would give six months for the implementation with Obama having the opportunity to, you know, delay and do waivers and so forth. Following this, the European Union approved something uh, similar well, the European Union wasn't similar in the sense that it wouldn't impose punishments on other countries, but it said members of the European Union cannot get it, and that was 20% of Iran's oil. The implementation of it was set for six months, so there's like about four months left to this, but already as a result of this, as a result of at least the possibility, if not the likelihood, of Iran not being able to sell oil, uh, the Iranian economy has hit a very serious problem. The real, which is the national currency has gone down at least 30, 35 percent. Uh, and the regime has tried to maintain stability. They've implemented new policies on interest rates. They've raised the interest rates trying to, you know, encourage people not to convert their savings and whatnot into uh, dollars and other foreign currency and so forth. But this is right now, even though, again, when we hear sanctions and Iran has been under sanctions for years, this, this one is beginning to have a serious effect. And how far that effect will be, I don't know. I think part of it depends on how much Iran will be able to uh, sell oil to other customers. Japan will continue to buy. I think they reached a deal with the US to cut their um, purchase of Iranian oil by 10% or so. China has said, India has said that they will continue to buy oil. But at the very least, it will reduce the oil revenues of Iran. Uh, and of course, uh, at, at the most, depending on how things go, it could completely cripple the economy. And if it cripples the economy and you know increase poverty and hard to find food and medicine and so forth, that's exactly what the sanctions are supposed to do. That's what they're designed to do. And we know from the experience of Iraq. Uh, I want to. Uh, 
Um, let me say a couple of things about assassinations. I know I don't have too much time, and some of the things, uh, hopefully, we can continue in the discussion. Uh, the assassinations of Iranian nuclear scientists. On January 11th, there was the latest one, uh, a nuclear physicist by the name of Mustafa Ahmadi Roshan, uh, who was a uh, supervisor at a nuclear enrichment facility. He was assassinated by car bombs. And there's been many of these car bomb attacks that have killed these scientists. Uh, on July 23rd, 2011, another physicist was uh, shot in the throat in front of his daughter's kindergarten in Tehran. Um, another, in, on November 29, 2010, nuclear scientist Dr. Majid Shahriar, he was also assassinated on his way to work. Uh, same kind of uh, device, the, the, uh, you know, the bomb that attaches to the, to the automobile with a magnetic device and then it blows up. Uh, blows up. So uh, Dr. Faridun Abbasi narrowly escaped. It was a simultaneous assassination attempt. So this is Abbasi escaped. January 2010, another nuclear scientist by the name of Mas'ud Ali Muhammad, he was murdered. Again, an uh, improvised explosive device. 2007, nuclear scientist Adashir Hassan Poor was killed by poisoning. And you know, there's been other cases, very suspicious explosions and so forth. But these assassinations have all been carried out quite professionally. There's no factions of the Iranian regime that is opposed uh, to the uh, nuclear program. In fact, very few people in Iran, regardless of what they think, whether they support or don't support the regime, they support the Iran's right to the development of nuclear energy. So these assassinations, professionally carried out, could not be the result of some kind of a factional issue between, you know, within the Islamic Republic. They are, uh, they are done professionally, they're done from the outside, and very, very likely, even though there's no evidence, I mean, who would have the motives? I know that in criminal cases, the first thing that they think about is motives. And who would have the motive to have the serial assassination of these scientists? It is obvious, US, Israel. I mean, there's actually some things that have come out that have indicated um, that Israel uh, has been the direct hand in this as opposed to the US. Um, it's very interesting that the Israeli officials, even though they don't you know, for obvious reasons, they don't take responsibility for the assassinations. They actually boast about them in, indirectly. Israel Defense Forces Chief of Staff Benny Gantz has referred to the assassinations of Iranian scientists as, quote, events that happen unnaturally. And he stated that he expected more unnatural events to occur this year. So if you make a prediction of unnatural events happening, what does that tell you? So. When we talk about uh, you know, the sovereignty of a country, we have to keep the assassinations in mind. I'll say one more thing about the, the, the drones. And um, well, on the drones, uh, let me uh, say this. Or maybe I better skip the second okay. video because I wanted to say another thing also. So how are we doing with time? 8.03, right? Doing good. Doing good. Doing good. Doing good. <laughs> <laughs> so by popular demand, I'll continue. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, the main thing about the drones, we have to keep in mind, I mean, I think most people follow the news of the U.S. drone having been brought down, and if you have time later, it's actually quite interesting how it was brought down. Initially, it was denied, but then the, some details got published as to how technically they could have been brought down in Iran. But, I mean, what are these drones doing there? I mean, keep in mind, if, they're the, if the purpose of the drones is to fight the uh, resistance in Afghanistan, not that that would justify it, not that, you know, by the virtue of the occupation of Afghanistan, Afghanistan's airspace becomes fair game to the U.S. But if we took that assumption, I mean, the Taliban and other resistance forces in Afghanistan don't have radars, obviously, right? So what's the point of the drones? Drones are, you know, they um, evade radar. And we know that increasingly, and in fact, Obama said this in his campaign, and this has become true, especially of Pakistan, is that the number of drone attacks and bombings have gone up several times, many more times than they were under Bush. And they're used to evade the uh, air defenses of Pakistan, even though the Pakistani government is not necessarily very decidedly uh, uh, fighting against the constant invasion of their airspace. And also the, dr the drones that were in, in Iran, the one that was brought down. 
What was the drawing doing there? They said, okay, technical malfunction. Well, the one thing that has come out, one thing that I learned through this process is that the drones are designed such that if they lose control with their headquarters, which is in, I think it's in Arizona, CIA, the control directed by the CIA, not even by the military. If they lose their controls, the GPS takes over. So therefore, there's no reason for the thing to go into Iran. It would go back, the GPS basically leads it to its, uh, um, to its, uh, the, wherever it took off from, to its headquarters uh, or the airport that it took off from. There have been many, many drones that have been sighted. Of course, it's hard to see them. You know, they evade radar. There have been previous drones that have gone down in Iran. So for years, the drones have been collecting information on Iranian defense systems. And in some instances, what they want to do is they want to figure out where the radars are, how they react, and that kind of a thing. So, so the drones are another way in which the sovereignty of not just Iran but also Pakistan and of course Afghanistan are, are, are violated on a daily basis and you know President Obama and you know the other administration officials are proud of it this is part of and we know that you know the whole thing about respecting the sovereignty of other countries the whole thing about um, their attack inside Pakistan and that whole Osama bin Laden thing uh, I'll deal with one issue. Will there be a war? And of course, that's a key question, and obviously I don't have a definitive answer. But I want to say a couple of things about it. One is that since the axis of evil speech of Bush, I mean, a lot of us in the anti-war movement and a lot of the population in general have been worried about the U.S. invading. And there's been many, many cases, including several times when Seymour Hersh, investigative, uh, investigative journalist, has published plans, sometimes with specific dates, before, you know, after the elections in 2008, in 2000, spring of 2007, several times when an invasion was about to happen. This is not to dismiss the possibility of an invasion. I mean, the U.S. has certainly done enough invasions and occupations for us to take all of such threats seriously. I mean, we need to organize for it and, and um, basically be ready for it. But at this time, and I want to emphasize the point of sanctions, at this point, what the U.S. administration thinks is that the sanctions are working, the sanctions are weakening Iran. And even if there is going to, the, the purpose is regime change. And regime change can come in several ways. The US does not insist on invading and bombing. If they can get their kind of regime in place without bombing or without invading, they're perfectly happy to do that. So there's several scenarios under which they can proceed. And of course we know that a, uh, an economic collapse in a given country can provide opportunities, can provide opportunities by um, you know, CIA and its operatives and their NGOs and others who already have a network in place. And of course, there will be parts of the population who are disenchanted either for broad reasons or specifically for the sanctions and the hardship and the poverty and the limitations that they will cause. One other point that I uh, want to raise is, and I, you know, People often ask me this, why is the Iranian leadership willing to go through so much, so much risk, so much talk of being annihilated, so much talk of all options on the table by Israel, by the US, or any combination thereof? Why don't they just give up the, you know, how important could the nuclear program be? Um, wouldn't it make sense for them to say, okay, we'll stop uranium enrichment, okay, we don't want it. If it costs us so much, we don't want it. The answer, my answer, and I think in the analysis of a lot of people, not just my answer, of course, is that it's not about that. If tomorrow the Iranian leadership said, okay, no more nuclear weapons program, they will continue to raise the bar. The sanctions, the, at least the U even if the UN sanctions get lifted, which is really not all that significant, the US sanctions will not get lifted. And uh, the raising of the bar is something that we constantly saw in the, um, during the inspections of 12 years in Iraq. So then they would raise human rights. Then they would raise support for terrorism, which is the Palestinian resistance and the Hezbollah movement in Lebanon. Uh, then they will raise the issue of, oh, you have to have a constructive role in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and so forth. So even if they were to completely capitulate on this issue against the wishes of the majority of the Iranian people, it would not, nothing would change. Because again, we have to keep in mind the goal of the U.S. and its junior partners in Iran is regime change. And the weapon of choice today for making that happen is sanctions. 
And I, for that reason, I think it's unlikely under the current circumstances that the US or Israel will, will attack. In fact, I think a lot of this, oh, Israel wants to attack, we want to go tell them not to attack and so forth. I think the purpose of that is to supplement the sanctions, to create more instability, to create more economic problems, and to make the sanctions more effective. Israel would not attack Iran. Israel's attacks against Lebanon, against Syria, against Gaza, all of the crimes that Israel has ever committed have been with the explicit you know, permission and often operational support of the US. Israel is not going to do something uh, on its own against the wishes of, of the US. So what is our task? Uh, I will repeat what we already know. Regardless of um, you know, uh, the specifics of, and this is true, by the way, of Libya, Syria, and elsewhere. Whatever we think of the regime, whatever we think about conflicts going on in a given country, it is not the place of the US government to uh, tell the people of other countries how to live, what kind of a government they, they should have. And of course, we know it's not well-intentioned. If it's a parliamentary democracy that the US wanted for Iran, for Syria, for Libya, we wouldn't have seen the overthrow of a democratically elected government and a parliamentary system. So our task is to oppose all forms of intervention, whether it's assassinations, sanctions, threats of war, bombings, uh, funding, democratic opposition, uh, propaganda, all other forms. Our task is to keep our government, the US government, which is not really our government, it's the government of the 1%. But the government that we can see here and have some influence on, hopefully through our struggle, our task is to keep it from uh, assassinations, keep it from interventions, war, and sanctions. Thank you. A couple of days ago, I had an interview on Russian TV. It runs for 12 minutes, and it you know raises some of the things we talked about. But he's a very elegant speaker, and it would be good if people were uh, you know. Uh, feeling like they can listen to another 12 minutes to uh, do that. Otherwise, we could either do it after the break. Do it now. So the people might okay, so what, how do people feel about it? Do you want to hear it? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. While we're doing that, I just want to support the work that Boss is doing, the Answer Coalition is doing. So I'm going to pass these around. Um. Thank you for joining us on RT. Thank you. What does the United States want from tightening the sanctions? I mean, it's even beyond tightening the sanctions now. Indeed it is. The United States government has created an artificial crisis. That's first and foremost. It's a manufactured crisis. Iran is complying with the IAEA. Iran does not have a nuclear weapon. Iran is not threatening its neighbors. Iran has not started a war with any of its neighbors. Uh, Israel, on the other hand, has hundreds of nuclear weapons, and unlike Iran, uh, refuses to sign the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, does not allow IAEA inspectors into its country. Uh, so there's not really a nuclear menace or a nuclear danger from Iran. So what is the cause? What's the cause of the crisis, of the artificial crisis? The real goal is the United States government has embarked on a course of extreme economic aggression against Iran with the hope that by creating economic suffering, economic isolation, economic misery, that part of the population will rise up or become disenfranchised with the government so that the U.S. can do, as it has in history, carry out regime change. They denied that. The U.S. denied that it's trying to carry out a regime change in Iran. Right. I mean, we have to take that with a very, very big grain of salt because we know that uh, since 1979, the United States refuses to have relations with the Islamic Republic of Iran. Why? Is it because Iran is a dictatorship? Well, it's actually a democratic government. It has democratic features far beyond some of America's most foremost allies in the Middle East, such as Saudi Arabia, for instance. Since 1979, Iran became an independent government. Before that, between 1953 and 1979, when the Shah was there, the Shah acted basically as a proxy or a puppet or a client of the American um, power. And so the U.S. says uh, they're not carrying out regime change, but in fact, everyone who's watching knows that indeed is the U.S. policy to create pressure on Iran, carry out overt opera covert operations, economic sanctions. And now these new sanctions are not really even uh, like the old sanctions. They are saying to the rest of the world, if you dare do business with Iran's central bank, if you buy Iranian oil, which constitutes half of Iran's uh, GNP, 
If you have any business with Iran whatsoever, you will not have access to American banks, to American corporations, to the American market. This is, in fact, a blockade, something like an economic blockade of Iran. And by international law, an economic blockade is an act of war. And so we should understand it just like that. So what, what do you think Iran's response is going to be? Well, Iran um, so far has been very prudent. Uh, even though they said that they would uh, consider closing the Strait of Hormuz, that six-mile stretch of the Persian-Arabian Gulf, uh, where 25 percent of the world's oil supply goes through. Um, and even though much was made of that in the Western media, in fact, Iran has not done anything to give the U.S. Uh, a, a, a excuse. pretext, an excuse, uh, a provocation, so to speak, that would allow the United States or Israel to trigger uh, a set of military actions. Uh, Iran, I think, uh, is also telling its people that we are not panicked. We, the Iranian government, are not panicked, uh, that they're trying to pr uh, show that they have a serenity and a calmness and a confidence and that they will weather the storm. But in fact, economic sanctions are taking a bite on the Iranian economy right now. There is a lot to say about this Israeli-U.S. possible attack, especially Israeli uh, uh, possible attack. Wall Street Journal says that the U.S. is planning a plan B should Israel attack. I think the Israelis uh, try to pretend that Iran constitutes an existential threat to Israel. I don't think that that, in fact, is the case, even though Iran's military has the capability to do great damage to uh, Israel in the event of a war, even though Israel is a nuclear power. I think that the Israeli government has an, a pattern and a practice of invasion and bombing of its neighbors in the Middle East. It carried out the bombing of Iraq's uh, nuclear facility in 1981, even though that was uh, permitted by international law and subject to IAEA inspections. In other words, a nuclear program for civilian energy purposes. Israel came and bombed it. They did the same to Syria uh, in the last few years, and they would like to carry out military strikes against the Iranian government. The Americans don't want that right now, uh, even though they they're happy to be, have Iran in a state of tension. They don't really want Israel to become the main uh, protagonist with the Iranian government by carrying out an unprovoked military strike. I mean, I'm talking about s the main sectors in the American establishment, because that would then present the crisis, uh, that struggle between the Islamic Republic of Iran on one side and the Israeli Zionist regime on the other. And in that case, Iran will be able to mobilize mass support throughout the Middle East for it. The United States has a different tack. They want to keep Israel sort of in the background, looming, dangering, uh, threatening Iran in one way, keeping Iran in a state of tension, perhaps militarily, but have the economic sanctions do the bulk of the work uh, by carrying out economic and financial isolation against the Iranian government. They think in the long term that's the easier way, the better way, the more effective way to carry out regime change. The U.S. is puzzled in this as well. That they're blustering, that they're going to cut it off, which would be a very bold act of war, would it not? And won't, and it, and it sounds like that might even happen. What, what do you know about that? Yeah, that's a very important point, and I probably should have raised that. There's a, a banking institution, it's called SWIFT, and the SWIFT itself is an acronym. I don't know exactly what it stands for, but Basically, it's an electronic banking system so that the monies that go, thank you very much, the monies that go around, like countries buying oil and other things, international transactions go through the SWIFT. And the idea of the SWIFT was that it would remain non-political, and the non-political meaning that based on countries being at war with one another and sanctions and so forth, the operations of the SWIFT wouldn't change. However, the U.S. in particular has put a lot of pressure and the European Union on the SWIFT to cut off Iran, which means that it make it, and I think part of that is because, well, two things. One is they see that the sanctions already have had some effects, so they want to tighten it uh, a lot. And then the other thing, and that's an important lesson, is that as much as the, here in the U.S., the 1%, as has become the terminology correctly in the U.S., really the 0.1%, as they control the, uh, the 
you know, institutions, the government, the banking system, the electoral process and so forth, that same 1% also controls international bodies. I mean, in the UN, there's some resistance to the US, but for the most part, the US gets its way. For the most part, even countries that do not want to go along because they don't want to pay the heavy price that could be associated with that, which could be economic or military, they go along. You know, we saw what happened in Libya with the abstentions of China and Russia and what happened with the NATO bombings and of course the gangs of criminals that are running the country. Which doesn't necessarily mean of course that we have to be uncritical of the government that existed, but NATO intervention does not result in gains for uh, democracy. But the SWIFT thing, it looks like they have reached agreement, like SWIFT capitulated despite, I believe, I mean, my understanding is Charter says it shouldn't engage in this kind of a thing, but you know, with the US pressuring it, they might go along. And if that happens, it basically leaves Iran with the option of selling oil only as barter. Like, uh, you know, uh, the other possibility is, and they've talked about this, they may be able to sell oil to uh, India and in exchange get rupees, which actually has another significance, and that's non-dollar denominated oil exchanges, so it may have that significance as well. Uh, but uh, basically, and, and then it may be that we give you this much oil and you give us this much, you know, rice or whatever the case may be. So there's a lot of hands. Should I, I guess I, I'll go in this direction and I'll go back and, yes? Sir. Um, I have a question about uh, your statement that Iran resists inspection of military sites by the IAEA. And I'm wondering, uh, isn't, wouldn't that be one of the places that uh, inspectors would want to go, the military bases, because that's where they might be stored or maintained or research might be going on. Well, I mean, Iran's stance has so far been that, you know, in fact, there's been even at the nuclear facility, and there's several. There's one in Iraq, Iraq, Iraq which is a city in central Iran. There's one in Natanz. The there's a nuclear power plant in Boucher. There's another facility in Esfahan, there's another facility in Tehran, and of course there's a new plant in, in near the city of Qom at, at a site called Fordo. They've opened all of these up to inspections. In fact, in some, I don't believe that's happening now, but they even had allowed the inspectors to have around the clock inspections. So uh, uh, around the clock cameras running. So what Iran is trying to prevent to do is to, based on suspicions and accusations, open up all of its military facilities because, again, the concern is not so much that they'll find something uh, that indicates uh, you know, plans to build nuclear bombs. They, their, their concern is for the inspectors to gain more information. Let me say this. Since the start of this thing, there has been you know, very handsome rewards for people who might defect. And that's very easy to defect from Iran. So if there were another plant where, uh, you know, either nuclear bombs were being designed or delivery facilities and so forth, you can be absolutely sure. And in every other country, there's always, even in Israel, uh, there's been, you know, whistleblowers and so forth. So, um, I mean, my point is not necessarily that no one has thought in Iran that it's a good idea to build nuclear weapons, because quite frankly, if they had nuclear bombs, then all options would not be on the table for the US and Israel. But it's that through the inspections regime and its expansion as it happened to Iran, Iraq, what would likely happen is an erosion of Iran's ability to defend itself in the case that it is those 10,000 uh, targets are, are uh, hit. So this side, okay, sir. So what would happen? I'm sorry, the, the gentleman. Yeah. 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 Which, which gentleman? <laughs> the one in the in the bay jacket, and, and you're, you're next. Go ahead, sir. Go ahead, Jerry. 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 Oh, me. Okay. Uh, what what would happen if Iran said to Israel, "Well, you know, we'll happily give up our nuclear program if you'll give up yours." <laughs> That's a very good point, and in fact, it, Iran has said that several times. In fact, not just Iran, but many people have called for Middle East free of nuclear weapons. It would make sense, right? Guess who was opposed to it? The, the U.S. You know. Not just Israel, but even the U.S. The Middle East free of nuclear weapons, and Iran has said that. Has said that you know. uh, and in fact, I mean, the idea of Israel not having nuclear weapons, because if you can imagine, Israel is a country that has, in addition to 
the extreme hardships and the crimes that it has committed against Palestinian people. It has attacked every one of its neighbors, you know, <laughs> yes, everyone, true. you know, <laughs> Egypt, Jordan, Syria, everyone. So the last thing you'd want is a, a very aggressive country having nuclear weapons. And so everyone in the Middle East, including the U.S. client states in Saudi Arabia and, and you know, uh, Jordan and the United Arab Emirates and Kuwait and o Oman and all the rest of them would be happy if Israel didn't have nuclear weapons. So that is a good propaganda line and it's a real thing, but Iran has proposed that didn't go anywhere because, of course, it's not fair. I'll go with the gentleman in gray and then... Uh, yeah. This last week I asked Peter Parson the same question in Davis and I asked him whether... <coughs> Uh, is, isn't it true that regime change is what Israel and the United States are after? He said, no, it's, it's the atomic weapons. But quite apart from that, uh, I don't, and I agree with you, actually, I disagree with him, not that I know anything about this. But I do want to ask this question. The, that's kind of in line with the question I asked him. The idea of regime change in Iran, I wonder whether it can even be accomplished, because, and here's my theory, Iran it wants to be a first world country, believes it's a first world country, is doing this atomic stuff to part, to partly to demonstrate to itself and to the world that it's a first world country. Iran has a highly educated population. It has resources. It has, uh, it has a, a, a fairly good uh, standard of living. It's not a third world country anymore. And I'm wondering whether, I guess you're Iranian, whether you could imagine that whether even if America and Israel accomplish a regime change, they can't get the kind of regime anymore in that country that they hope to get because the people won't accept being a third world country. They demand to be a first world country. I mean, that, I think that's, that's an excellent question. I mean, one of the things that we have to point out is that Iraq, for all the crimes that the U.S. and its allies committed through the years of sanctions and through the years of the occupation, I mean, it certainly didn't uh, come out as a state that has respect for human rights. It's not a democratic state. And, but all of that is, is are non-issues as far as the U.S. is concerned. But it's very interesting that Iraq hasn't come out to be a client state either. I mean, that, and that's... Uh, it's very interesting that the ruling elite in Iraq, while you know they uh, cooperated with the occupying forces and they helped them put down the resistance and so forth, so we're not making them into heroes of independence, but on a lot of issues, they haven't taken orders from Washington. And I think part of that is that despite the drive on the part of the Bush administration and the neocons and a good part of the U.S. ruling establishment, all the enthusiasm that, okay, you're taking all these independent states back, put them back in their place, you know, make them colonies again, it hasn't really worked out. Because the U.S. Uh, goal is not just to kill people. I mean, they easily and comfortably kill people, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions, but they have an objective. And if you look at it, look at the objective that they had in Iraq, yes, they overthrew the independent state of Iraq, and even that independent was, you know, questionable during times because the regime worked with the uh, U.S. at times and then didn't work at other times. Anyway, it wasn't a compliant enough regime, but from the perspective of Washington, and one of the things that they had to sacrifice in the course of their occupation of Iraq was to give up having a completely, uh, you know, client regime of the kind of uh, Iyad Alawi, you know, uh, with the Iraqi National Alliance and so forth. So that is, that is a, a, a valid question. I don't know if they have their kind of regime change, if they'll be able to get you know, another complete client state. Even in Egypt, where so far the revolution has, I mean, the revolution still continues, the people are still in Tahrir, the people are still in the streets, um, and the military, you know, Mubarak's military is still in power, but even that military has to respond somewhat in order to survive has to respond somewhat to the will of the people therefore at least right now and they have some of these NGO types uh, you know locked up and they're, they're saying they're gonna try them that may well be to gain the support of the people I mean in Iran of course and in every country there's parts of the population that are not you know for the regime and at times whether an Iran could be a repeat of the Green Movement, or it could be a regional thing. Iran is a multi-ethnic country. There's Kurds in the Northwest, and Azeris also in the Northwest. There's Arab minorities in the Southwest. 
there's the Baluchis to the southeast, and there's many other uh, you know, minorities. And there's already been a, an attempt on the part of the US to do that. So I think it is possible that they can do a regime change through a combination of uh, you know, forcing an economic collapse and then tapping into the um, uh, uh, disenchantment of parts of the population. But the question even then is, are you going to get a, you know, a regime that only responds <coughs> to the upper sectors of the population who may be very pro-West and more than willing to have another Saudi Arabia or Turkey, or will, they, will even the new regime have to respond to the will of the you know, bulk of the population, which is not for Iran returning back to the time of the Shah, where everything is at the service of the US and the most powerful man in the country is the U.S. ambassador. Yes. Isn't that the, isn't that the uh, goal of the U.S. is to eventually take over the Middle East and the oil? Plus, the strategically, uh, by the U.S. You know, it seems like Israel has a role to keep like a watchdog on the rest of the Middle East for the United States. The United States have a purpose of eventually dominating the world. Greed and power seems like it's you know limitless. You know, when a person is hooked onto that, like you know uh, drugs, you get, and you get hooked on it. You know. right. Seems to point in that direction. I'm not saying that you know it's true, but I'm pretty sure it's true. Absolutely. I mean, it's a, a term that it's a imperialist country. But we say we go into let, let war in the Middle East right, for freedom and democracy, but it was for the oil. It was imperialism that was motivating our country, certain people in the country. And yes. the people in yeah. this country are brainwashed when they go along with it. Yes, it is, it is not mistaken policy. It is not an error. It is pursuit of imperialist interests. And unfortunately, both Republicans and Democrats pursue the same goals, albeit with different tactics at different times. At the time of the invasion of Iraq, when they had the so-called cakewalk and when they didn't foresee the resistance coming, they were openly talking about redrawing the map of the Middle East. Redrawing the map of the Middle East is not a term that we made up. They were talking about that. I mean, John Bolton said that Iran and Syria should heed the lessons of Iraq, meaning if you're going to continue to be independent, you're next. What happened was that because of resistance in Iraq, I mean, they couldn't, they had to shelve their plans for the next invasion. Everyone was talking about who's next. Everyone was talking about who's next, and the possible targets were Syria, Iran, and maybe Libya. I mean, the more extreme factions of the ruling class were even talking about Saudi Arabia because the sheikhs of Saudi Arabia, out of every hundred times, maybe one time they say no to the US and they wanted to, you know get rid of that as well. But yes, I agree with you, and that's the point. Redrawing the map of the Middle East for imperialism means getting rid of every independent state, every state that does not welcome, you know, Chevron and Exxon and the rest of them, and they're not in Iran right now, and they're everywhere else in the, you know, in the, in the Middle East. The 50-50 plan that the movie talked about, it's in place in every uh, of these, every one of these U.S. client <coughs> states. Every one of these U.S. client states, just about every one of them is far, far less democratic and far more, uh, you know, in violation of human rights than, I mean, most of these, like, Saudi Arabia has never even had an election, or Bahrain, or Kuwait, and so forth. But, yes, it's, I mean, if there's one thing we know is, we need, uh, we need to know is, uh, we need to know the goals behind it, and it's not democracy, and human rights, and modernization, and, you know, whatever else. It's imperialism. They want to control the resources. Uh, let me go to Maggie, then the gentleman, then the gentleman here. Um, well, I know Richard Becker has said before that part of the motivation is to keep oil away from China and to contain China and eventually Japan. But it's, if that's the case here, it would seem like this strategy is, is to push Iran, right, to, to work more with China, Russia, and Japan and the extent Japan will work with them. So, I mean, what, how does that, do you want to comment on that? I mean, sure. is, is that our... Is China in a position where it could, you know, help Iran out, you know, so? Sure. No, I, I think that's a valid point. I mean, one thing we have to say is that the purpose of the U.S. ruling class, uh, the 1% or the 0.1%, is not to be able to purchase the oil. I mean, the U.S. can buy oil anywhere. In fact, much of Venezuela's oil, uh, another, you know, target for regime change, uh, much of Venezuela's oil comes to the U.S. It's control of the resources because Oil can be a weapon. I mean, China has some oil, but with its very rapid industrial expansion, it has far outstripped its production, so it has to get oil from elsewhere. 
One of the reasons that China is not necessarily giving up on this issue and wants to continue to trade with Iran on oil is that it is worried that, I mean, the likes of Saudi Arabia and the rest of oil producing countries and even Iraq, if the U.S. tells them to stop to sell to China, then they may very likely do that. Therefore, the U.S. will have the, you know, the ability to suffocate China. So that is very true. Uh, so you could argue, and I've seen actually, uh, you know, analysts, you know, the one percent analysts, we might say, expressing the same worries that, you know, on the one hand you're trying to make the Iranian regime collapse, but on the other hand you're pushing them toward China. Well, that policy kind of makes sense from the perspective of the U.S. because if, I mean, they're thinking more long term. So if they manage to make Iran's economy collapse and have regime change, and or if they manage to weaken Iran's state to the point that they can have a relatively easy bombing and invasion and so forth, then it wouldn't matter what deals the Islamic Republic had with China. Then they figured that the replacement regime, the new democratic regime, will not have that problem. But it is, it is somewhat of a gamble, and I think, I think you're right, sir. Yes, uh, <clears throat> as we know, uh, this country's already... Uh, see, my question is, if, if uh, there is continuous uh, conflict in the Middle East, and as we know, the country U.S. is already 15 billion in national debt. Um, could this be a tipping point where the United States? I mean, we're I know we're bankrupt. The the war economy is not working for anybody. Right. Right. I mean, you know, we we could have five dollars or more gas. Could this be the tipping point where the United States actually like roam an unlimited, you know, war war spending, where the United States actually goes bankrupt? And uh, you know we really start seeing just massive amount of just meltdown. We already know the, the middle class is melting down. Sure. Do you think that this could be the tipping point if we have you know Israel attacks is, uh, Iran and then you have you know chaos? Right. And you know it's really hard to predict. One of the things about you know what we Marxists refer to as revolutionary situations is that you can never predict them. Uh, very recently, we were one of our uh, activists in San Francisco was reading to us about a year before the uh, <coughs> Arab Spring, an Egyptian writer for the newspaper Al Ahram writing that there must be some genetic defect with the Arabs because they have all these tyrants ruling them and they never rise up. And sure enough, less than a year later, we have a, a wave of revolutions sweeping through the Arab world. So. It is hard to predict, you know, I, I, I'm sorry, I can't really answer your question. I will say this, though, and this is an important point. You know, economic collapse itself may be a, sometimes it is a necessary condition, but it's not a sufficient condition for bringing about a situation where, you know, uh, the whole regime is threatened. If you think of the, say, the Weimar Republic, uh, Germany after World War I with the reparations and economic collapse to the point that you had to bring a cart full of, uh, you know, bills to buy a, you know, a loaf of bread or something like that. Uh, you know, inflation of 10,000%, basically, you know, we were back to barter, but it did not collapse. And when a situation like that happens, because the system will not collapse of its own, the system ha has its police, it has its military, it has its institutions, courts, uh, administration, and so forth. So. It takes that, but it takes more. It takes um, basically people organizing. I think it's a very exciting thing as our sister with the uh, Sacramento Occupy movement is here. And I think that's an important start. And hopefully it can um, you know, grow bigger and wider to the point that wider sectors of the population will go into struggle. Unfortunately, the thing is not going to collapse on, on its own. The beast has to be uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, recently in the paper there was uh, pictures of the subterranean uh, nuclear facility that uh, Iran is constructing. Uh, what do you think would be the implications if uh, Israel would be so foolish to try to use blockbusters and would, would blockbusters have any effect or have, do you think the design is such that let them blow away, but uh, they'll never affect what we want to do. 
Right, the new facility, the one they're talking about, is actually built into kind of a mountain. So any bunker busters will have to break through 80 meters or roughly 2,400, uh, 240 feet of rock and, and sand and so forth. So Israel does not have any such, at least for that facility. I mean, there are facilities that are <coughs> overground and, and Israel could do that. I think the main purpose of that facility and it's not a nuclear weapons facility, and even that has been inspected, but it is at a point where it would be extremely difficult, if not impossible, to penetrate into. I mean, the US has nuclear bunker busters that may be able to penetrate that deep. Other than that, if Israel even were to bomb that, it would be, uh, it would be uh, you know, superficial damage. But if we, Israel, I'm sorry, go ahead. Have we, have we given Israel those, those nuclear uh, blockbusters to to do that, or uh, because Israel probably I doubt I doubt is constructed themselves when they've had uh, right. U.S. help. Right. To my knowledge, they haven't, and I think actually, if Israel were to attack Iran, it would be with the intention of dragging the U.S. in. I mean, the Israeli air force is strong, but it's not nearly strong enough to be able to annihilate I Iran on its own. It would be with the intention of dragging the U.S. in. I think there's other technical difficulties. It would uh, require refueling because the, you know, fighter jets have a relatively uh, short range. You can't fly them thousands of miles. So they have to uh, refuel in midair and you'd have to have very, very serious uh, penetrating bombs. That would be a job that it's even questionable if the U.S. could do that. And of course the reason they haven't done it is two things. One is, like I said, going back to the original issue, the issue is regime change, and you can't implement regime change no matter how many people you kill, which is not their issue. You could bomb all the nuclear <coughs> facilities, but how will that result in regime change unless you have something like a half a million ground troops? Because Iran is four times as large as Iraq, 75 million population, mountainous terrain. It will take a huge force to do that. But again, I want to emphasize, I don't want to dismiss the possibility of an attack because like I said, it, you always have to take him seriously. But as the sanctions are working, as in working, uh, as in causing, uh, you know, problems and, and, and uh, serious economic issues, poverty and so forth, as long as they're doing that, I don't see them attacking. And the fact that they're giving a date, like Israel is going to attack by June, that seems very unusual. If you're going to attack, why would you announce the time of your attack? You know? <laughs> uh, uh, Esteban and then the gentleman here. Uh, the president of Iran recently did like a tour of some Latin American countries. And I wanted to ask uh, what came out of that? Um, you know, uh, what is the situation with Iranian allies, independent nations, and right. like how important could they be to Iran's cause in preventing the war and sanctions? Right. I think it is very significant, especially when they talk about the isolation of uh, Iran. Iran has many allies. In fact, the non-aligned nations, even though they have no control over the UN, UN Security Council, it's like 110 countries that meet. They've met in Havana. They've met in other places. And with like three or four uh, negative votes, they've uh, repeatedly over the years uh, approved Iran's right to the development of nuclear energy. Iran is also a... Uh, uh, observing member of ALBA, which is the Latin American alliance that is setting itself up against the, you know, U.S. trade agreements and, and, and so forth. Amani Najad has visited Venezuela many times. There's joint ventures building automobiles, um, uh, you know, housing projects, building houses for the poor. Uh, Chavez joked that, you know, they, they're building nuclear bicycles here because there's a bicycle plant <laughs> that's uh, being uh, built there. So. Uh, they have trades with other countries. I think in itself is not enough because Iran is mostly surrounded by countries that are either under U.S. occupation or U.S. military bases. You're looking to the north, you know, northwest, there's Azerbaijan, there's the former Soviet republics that are mostly U.S. client states right now. Uh, and they have, uh, of course, in Bahrain, which is another site of demonstrations that the U.S. says nothing about, and Saudi Arabia goes in and represses the people's revolt. That's another, the US Fifth Fleet. Saudi Arabia has bases, Kuwait has bases and so forth. So being surrounded by all of those US military bases, the alliances are important, but uh, of course we have to recognize the real danger uh, as well. Sir. 
Is there any kind of uh, environmental opposition to the development of nuclear energy in uh, Iran, like around the world? Uh, there are uh, environmental groups that are opposed to nuclear power plants and whatnot? Right. I mean, I'm not aware of it, which doesn't say, I mean, I travel to Iran usually once a year. I'm generally aware of the overall things. I'm not aware of that, which is not to say there isn't. I would agree with you about the serious environmental problems uh, with nuclear energy. Having said that, I think one of Iran's concern is, and a lot of people don't know this actually, the, you know, the nuclear uh, establishment in Iran started under the Shah. And at the time, no one said to the Shah, well, you got the equivalent of 60 years worth of gas, you're sitting in a sea of oil, why are you developing nuclear weapons? In fact, the, you know, the US and the British and the French competed with each other for contracts. So, in a way, after the Iran-Iraq war, <coughs> Iran restarted a project that was already there. It hadn't gone along very far, but it, it started. But Iran is worried because of its consumption of a million and a half barrels of oil a day, maybe even more. It, you know, the estimate, and not just uh, estimate of Iranian oil authorities, but I've seen European oil experts predict that in 15 to 20 years, it may not even have enough oil to um, to export. This is not to uh, dismiss the, you know, significant uh, impact of uh, and dangers and hazards of, of nuclear energy, but Iran is worried about being caught in a situation where it has no energy sources and, um, you know, being isolated as it is. Not is there, being is there a voice uh, in Iran for people like that? Are they welcome or uh, not welcome? Or Again, I'm not, okay. I, I, I don't, I don't have the answer to that question. Yeah, I don't have the answer to that. I'll call in Jesse and then the gentleman and Jesse. Um, do you think that they're targeting Iran at this particular point because Syria, uh, yes, the regime sure. in Syria is under threat right now? I think it's, it's, it's related because one of the things uh, about, uh, you know, it's very interesting that actually even um, Iraq has not joined in in the drive for regime change in Syria. I think it is significant in the sense, I mean, Iran and Syria do not have a border, so they're not, you know, that directly connected. I think one of the importances of Syria is that the help that Iran provides, financial and otherwise, to both Hamas, the resistance movement in Palestine, and Hezbollah, which is the, the force that drove out Israel from uh, uh, northern Lebanon, goes through Syria. Um, so I think that is significant. I think basically, I mean, there are plans that the U.S. establishment has the, you know, the whole military industrial complex and, and, and the uh, think tanks and the, you know, different groupings of the, of the ruling class. Sometimes there are opportunities that come along and sometimes they have plans and they take advantage of both. I think the opportunity for Iran came along when the IAEA report, even though it wasn't anything drastic, just the inclusion of those suspicions in the report gave them the opportunity to declare a worldwide emergency, we need to do something, and so forth. And to the extent that they can overthrow one or the other, I think they will see it as an advantage um, to them. I heard years ago that uh, Iran's uh, refinery capacity was very limited and that, that that they required them to export their oil in order to import the refined product. Uh, doesn't that make them very vulnerable? Yes, this was uh, this was true. Up to 45 percent of Iran's domestic pr production had to be exported, refined, and brought back in. Two things happened over the last few years. One is that Iran, even though they didn't build any brand new facilities, they worked on expanding the capacity of the existing refineries, which were quite old and they hadn't been, really been upgraded. There was a convention, conversion of some petrochemical, I don't know the details of that, facilities into doing that. But then another thing was that uh, gasoline in Iran used to be, up to about a year and a half ago, practically free. It would be like 40 cents a gallon, you know. Of course it's sold in liters, but I'm kind of converting. And through a process, they uh, basically phased that out. And one of the things that that did is that it reduced consumption significantly. Well, it reduced consumption domestically, but then another thing, I had seen many times, you know, 50 miles from Iranian borders, there were all these 18-wheelers lined up for several miles 
at the gas stations to get pretty much free gas. And then there was also a lot of smuggling because they didn't want to go and pump gas on the other side of the border. Now with the price, it's still cheaper than most of Iran's neighbor or maybe all, but at least it's reduced that level of consumption. And of course, people, when they have to pay more, they you know consume less. So consumption has gone down. Uh, productive uh, refining capacity has gone up. I mean, the Iranian government claims that they, they're not doing that anymore. I don't know if that's entirely accurate, but even if it, it is not accurate, it's going to be a, not as significant a portion of Iran's oil would have to be uh, uh, sent out to be fined and brought back. Uh, yes, I have a question. Sure. <coughs> I have many Iranian friends, and I have noticed that many of them possibly would welcome a U.S. going in. Most probably they are pro Shah. I don't know. But uh, that is a little disturbing to me because that happened in Iraq and now the same people yes. who wanted yes. America and now they are crying for Saddam. Um, how many of those people you have in Iran? You go back and forth, so you must have yes. a feeling about it. Yes, I mean, uh, I, unfortunately I agree with you. Uh, I, mean, I mean, there's a couple of things. One is after the revolution in 1979, the first wave of people who immediately came. Of course, there was another wave of students who had been in the US. Some of the people who are a little older and were activists at the time, they know that at the time, the Iranian student movement was very militant and active against the Shah and against other things. So with the revolution, those elements, those students went back to Iran. The elements that came were the people who had you know, stolen things or you know, had wealth and came set up shop in LA, they have, and they still have their TV stations and everything. That's one factor. The other factor is the positions uh, of the Iranian people with regard to that same issue, welcoming an invasion, is very much uh, polarized on a class base. Like if you were in northern Tehran, you would run into a lot of people who would either overtly or indirectly would say that, would say, okay, well, you know, at least we'll have democracy and we'll be able to wear Nikes and have McDonald's and all that kind of <laughs> stuff. <laughs> yeah. And no hijab, right. So as you go further south in Tehran, it becomes less affluent and more working class. You see less and less of that. As you go into the provinces, you almost don't see that at all. But the thing is that the US, the Iranian population in the US, which is significant, is almost entirely from the, I'm not saying they're all from rich families, but it's really the kind of upper middle to upper layers of the society. And um, so at this time, the bulk of the Iranian community in the US is not particularly progressive. Not on I this issue, not on a lot of other issues. So yeah, unfortunately, that's, that's true. In fact, there's this view, and I've heard it several times expressed again in northern Tehran. There's this view that the US bombing will be, again, this precision thing. One bomb will go and kill Ahmadinejad, another one will go and kill, kill Khamenei, and then there'll be you know, bars and cabarets and everything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, John? Yeah, there's a, a quick anecdote and then a question. Um, but I was watching Al Jazeera, and there's an interview between uh, Mohammed Morandi. Um, he's a, an Iranian political scientist at the American University in Beirut, and um, an, Arab, an Israeli political analyst. And um, the Israeli guy was talking about, um, you know, you know, why is Iran, you know, like putting, you know, facilities in Florida? You know, why are they putting it under a mountain? And then uh, Mirandi just responded back, because he's threatening to bomb us. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then uh, my question was, um, uh, could it be that um, along with the sanctions that they're waiting to see what happens with the elections that are coming up soon in Iran? Um, like to see if they can sort of recreate that green moment or something like that? I mean, I think it could be, and for those people who may not know, in a couple of weeks uh, there will be elections. There's, this is not the presidential elections, which will be in June of next year, 2013. It's congressional elections. Historically, the congressional elections, or the parliamentary, I should call it, elections in Iran, kind of like the U.S., they don't generate that kind of excitement. So I'm sure they have hopes, the U.S. and their allies may have hopes that they'll get something going. Um, the uh, campaign season is like, I believe it's like two weeks, people can correct me. But anyway, it's a limited period of time. Uh, it's not a, you know, endless campaign like the Republican primaries that have been done. You know. uh, right, right. So, uh, I mean, in a period when the economy has just taken a downturn, 
Whether that will provide any opportunities for destabilization, I don't know, but I think it's unlikely. If I were the US planners, I would probably plan for something to happen in the June of 2013, because there's a year and a half for the sanctions to take effect, meaning impoverish people and imp impose hardships on them, and then work on the democratic um, opposition. So all of these are my personal uh, you know, predictions, who knows? Of course, the drive is relentless, and it is flexible. It will look at various opportunities, and it will, and it doesn't matter what size of the population. I mean, one of the things, I know people here may have differences on the issue of Libya and the regime of Gaddafi, but one thing is certain, and that is in the east of Libya, in the Benghazi, the fact that even in the east of Libya, it's not like the rebels had full support of the population, but the U.S. and NATO decided that, uh, you know, that represented the will of all the Libyan people. And of course, people didn't hear anything about, like, a million people with U YouTube videos marching against NATO in Tripoli, uh, and, you know, those don't count. In Syria, people don't talk, and then there's complexities here, I don't want to oversimplify issues, but, I mean, a, uh, a polling uh, organization from Qatar did a uh, poll of Syria, 55% of the population support uh, Bashar Assad. This does not mean that they're good or bad or whatever. Everyone can make their own judgment. But the notion that the demonstrators represent the entire population and it's Gaddafi versus the people, or it's Assad versus the people, or it's Ahmadinejad versus the people, is an oversimplification and a purposeful simplification of, of issues. Because as far as the US is concerned, uh, you know, if there's any part of the population, if there's a mutiny in any part of the military, say in Kurdistan, even though in Kurdistan, for example, the US supports the Kurdish movement in Iran, but they oppose the Kurdish movement in <laughs> Turkey, which is actually where the Turks, the Kurds are by far mostly repressed, and it's something like 70% of the Kurdish population lives in Turkey. But Turkey is a NATO member, and of course you don't want to mess with that. So any part of the population, it could be small, but we'll see the Twitter demonstrations and so forth. That will be the pro-democracy opposition. The label pro-democracy will happen in hours, and then from there, there'll be NATO wanting to go save the people, and you know, we know the scenario. Uh, <laughs>